what is the difference between just loving my child and being connected to my child? And true connection with the child is unconditional acceptance for their temperament, their essence of who it is they are. And in the conscious parenting method, it's about learning from your child. It's about understanding that your child will trigger you because of things from your past. That's a good place to start. What are my expectations? Are my expectations too unrealistic of my child? Parents think that parenting is about having control. And if you think it's about having control, you will keep having power struggles with your child. You have to give them the power to make mistakes, to mess up and to figure it out. Childhood is a very separate phase of life even though it's the most important, it needs to be treated like childhood, not like adulthood. You know, children should go back to playing outside and not be playing video games. The screens are not healthy. You should say no to your children for screens if they're under 13. We should limit it. We are af afraid of these dangers nowadays, like drugs, uh, other substances. Yeah, you have to talk to your kid early on about drugs, like four, four years old, five years old. Don't wait till they're 12 try to work hard to help them to love themselves. If they love themselves, they won't go to drugs. Părinți cu minți cu Simona Gherghe și Oana Moraru Un podcast Zunivers Oricât de multe vrem să facem pentru copiii noștri și oricâte le-am oferit, cel mai de preț dar este timpul. Timpul petrecut împreună cu ei. V-am mai povestit că în weekenduri copiii mereu mă întreabă ce activități facem cu ei și pentru că și noi ne organizăm vacanțele din vreme, avem o sugestie pentru începutul lunii august. Cel mai mare festival de familii din România va avea loc între 2 și 4 august într-un cadru natural feric pe dealul Feleacului la Cluj. Vă invităm așadar la Wonder Family Fest, un regal de joacă, muzică și magie. Dintre artiștii care au confirmat de Deja că vor veni la festival sunt Luis Fonsi, Smiley, Iuliana Beregoi sau Theo Rose. Și ca experiența să fie una de neuitat, există un spațiu generos de campare unde puteți veni cu rulota sau, de ce nu, puteți să închiriați un cort. Mai multe detalii despre eveniment, dar și abonamente cu reducere găsiți pe site-ul wonderland.ro. Vor fi trei zile de poveste, un prilej minunat să le creați copilor voștri amintiri pentru o viață. Univers Podcasts Bun găsit! Sunteți la Părinți cu Minți, locul în care învățăm să fim părinți mai buni pentru copiii noștri. Sunt Simona Gherghe, alături de mine, ca de obicei, Oana Moraru, specialist în parenting și educație, autor de cărți, fondator de școală și, Oana, astăzi avem o ediție cu totul și cu totul specială pentru că invitata noastră este uh, un guru al parentingului, <laughs> aș îndrăzni să spun, yeah. unul dintre cei mai mari experți mondiali ai parentingului psiholog nincian, expert în dinamica familiei și dezvoltare personală, autoarea șase cărți, dintre care trei declarate bestseller de către New York Times. Doamnelor, domnilor, invitata noastră de astăzi este Dr. Shefali Sabari. Welcome, Dr. Shefali. Hi, how are you? It's a great honor for us to have you here at Parins Cumins in Romania. And um, it's a, a big privilege for us to talking to you and um, we have to tell you that uh, uh, your books are uh, so inspiring and all you do is so inspiring for uh, for us as parents and also for teachers as uh, Wana is also a teacher and um, I have here your uh, um, last book which is called uh, called in English uh, The Parenting Map the name in Romanian is uh, Harta Parentingului Modern, and the preface is written uh, by my colleague, Juana Moraru. <laughs> yes, yes, that's my latest book, and it really gives a step-by-step -step, uh, map for parents to to build connection with their children. But, Dr. Shefali, I would start with the very beginning of um, what you do. So, my first question will be, What means the conscious parenting in comparison with the traditional way of raising a child? Well, I think 
the traditional way we can agree is all about you know the parent knows best and the parent is in charge and the child is supposed to follow the parent and in the conscious parenting method it's about learning from your child it's about understanding that your child will trigger you because of things from your past and how to understand to raise yourself as much as you raise your children well for someone who's just starting on this path of recognizing its own patterns or its own triggers in the middle of a society that pulls us very hard to the other direction what would you recommend as a daily practice for a parent in order to just stay still or stay connected to itself or herself and not give up his or her child to the system i'm running a school i'm trying to make it like fun or open or able to adjust every kid's essence but it's so tough because the parents are are pulling me the other way the system is pulling me the other way how do i stay sane how do parents stay sane in this crossword yes world? i i think the first easy place to start is to look at your expectations of your child maybe your expectations are so unrealistic compared to where your child is your expectations are here and your child is here and the gap between the two is a lot of the problem where you have anger and anxiety because you're expecting something that they cannot deliver they cannot give so that's a good place to start that the next time you get into a conflict with your child or anyone is to ultimately ask you know maybe my expectation is unrealistic this person cannot do it especially our children you know they their brains are not yet developed they don't have the skills or the life experience to give us what we want so that's a good place to start what are my expectations are my expectations too unrealistic of my child yeah sure but speaking of uh, expectation um when we are expecting the child we have a quite different image of this reality of being a parent because we see movies we see other models um, other families um and it seems very nice very beautiful we prepare this journey we buy a lot of things <laughs> too much things for the newborn and then the baby comes and uh, the parent discovers that it's like a tsunami and it seems so 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 difficult and sometimes it is very difficult how can it be easier well again it's the expectation that the parent has that this baby will be this bliss and i can just control this baby and things will be perfect and flowing and that's not the case because it's another human being it's not a toy it's not a puppet so when when parents enter this journey they have a fantasy and they make this movie around oh my child will be so amazing and be talented and i'm going to feel so good but this is not the case because our children come with their temperament and they are human beings and what actually ends up happening is because we are not yet healed we cannot handle this very dependent very uh, tantruming young child it brings up all our feelings around not having control around feeling helpless so that comes together like a tsunami and it all blows up but when it becomes easier when it becomes easy <laughs> it becomes, it becomes easier only when the parent realizes and are willing to realize that they cannot control this person and that that's not a bad thing that's a good thing that they cannot control this person because parents think that parenting is about having control and if you think it's about having control you will keep having power struggles with your child you keep clashing with your child 
was like for those who are listening to us for the very first time, this sounds really crazy. If I don't have control, this kid would be very disrespectful. It will he will go wild. And what do you call having real connection with the kids? What does it look like to be attuned to this child? Because many parents mistaken this for love like they say i love my child so i must be attuned to him or yes, i love yes. my child so i must be connected now these yeah. two are very or three ideas are very different what is the difference between just loving my child and being connected to my child and having yeah. a good relationship yes many people feel that oh i say i love my child every day that means connection or look i'm working so hard for my child or yeah. look i'm taking care of my child every day that's all very good don't stop doing that but true connection with the child is unconditional acceptance for their temperament their essence of who it is they are and when a child feels understood feels seen like they're not a burden they're not uh you know taking away from the parent by just existing the parent is happy celebrate celebrating them doesn't feel like they are too much then the child feels seen and understood and known and that is our greatest desire is to be understood and <laughs> i offer that to my child if i the adult in my life i don't feel known and understood and seen can i offer this to my child if i don't no. feel it myself no mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really hard when you don't feel understood and if you feel like all your life you've been a burden on others then when the child wants you <clears throat> you're like this is my time to be heard to be seen and now my child is wanting me when is it my time mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you feel the the pressure of using your child to meet your needs and then the child's needs don't get met then the child feels disconnected then the child goes through their own panic attack their own anxiety and then the cycle continues so when the the other way is if the parent begins to understand themselves and love themselves and accept themselves then they can begin to not use the child to feel understood or use the child to to get their needs met you know you can ask your partner to meet your needs that way or your mother but you cannot use your child because your child cannot be responsible they're too young to feel the burden of an adult needing them maybe another adult can handle it but a child cannot handle it one of the most shocking um, uh, things i've read in your book is that uh, um, you you say one of the most um, important objective of a conscious parent is becoming irrelevant for his her child <laughs> can you explain me a little bit this uh the irrelevancy <laughs> yes well we are always going to be very important for our young children what i mean by that is as they grow up we need to move away to into the background and become less and less the star. You know, when our children are young, the parent is the star. And we don't like it when our children retire us, right? Okay, we don't need you anymore. We feel like we want to keep being needed and we want our children to come to us and ask us for our advice. And what I tell parents is that don't give so much advice after their 13, 14 you know become less the star go back to the backstage and become less important to your children what that means is that your children are learning to stand up on their own two feet your children are learning to become powerful your children are learning to follow their own direction and they're not looking to you to follow you all the time but that means you have to hand over the baton you have to give them the power to make mistakes to mess up and to figure it out and that's very hard for parents because we come with so much fear um how will i look if my child doesn't do it properly or what will happen in the future we're so nervous that we don't give them the power and also the fear if something bad is happening to uh, to my child 
Yes, yes, of course. So we're trying to control it because we know that we are not strong enough. If something happens to our child, we will fall apart. You see, we cannot handle the anxiety of the pain that our children will feel because we don't handle anxiety well. So we can't manage it. So we want to control them so we don't have to deal with it. Yeah, I have a daughter of your of the same age your daughter is, and I also identified a lot with your stories. And even now, when she's 21, she has some kind of hurt seasons, you know, about boyfriends, about relationship to other uh, um, students. She's in USC. Uh, so as a mother, I learned to relive her pain without saying anything, without psychoanalyzing her, without giving her advice, because she's smart enough to tell me, just stop, listen, Don't give me any advice. Just say, mm -hmm, uh-huh, oh, great. Oh, yeah, that's what she needs from me. But a two years old, three years old does not have the power to push the parent back. Yeah, Where I am now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just go with your old horses onto him or her. So what would you advise the parents? Like, what is the normal step you have to take in order to let them handle pain? Or what is the way we can get them through this because I find it hard even in, at my daughter's age just to hold on to my <laughs> words and not fix her pain because I, I'm so yeah, wise. It, it is yeah. Very good question. It is really understanding that when they're very small, when we begin to give them choices, when we begin to say, I don't know, what do you mm -hmm, think? Mm -hmm. Or let them have their emotions safely we don't realize how much they're growing from that. How much they are thinking, wow, I can handle it. Or mommy thinks I have a, a good mind or mommy's letting me control my own dress and my own shoes and my own homework. Wow, that means I'm capable. So even if they're messing up, the point is to make them feel capable of doing their own thing, managing it. Now, when we interfere, yes, we do it correctly and they do it right. But what they don't get is that sense of autonomy. And that's what our children want. Like, if you tell me that I can handle it, even if I'm messing it up and you tell me you got it and you can handle it, that is more important than not messing up. Sure. You see, mm -hmm. being told that I can handle it mommy trusts you is more important than me getting an A grade. You understand? Mm -hmm. So every opportunity you get to say, I trust you. I'm trusting you. Uh, you got this. Uh, it's hard, but you can do it. We got this. And if you really believe that, then you won't jump in so much to micromanage it. But it's because you don't believe that. You don't trust them. Because you have never trusted yourself. Because you get so scared of failure in your own life that you're so scared of failure for them. Because you fall apart when you get a C grade, you're trying to protect them from getting a C grade because you think they're going to fall apart. It's because of our own relationship to big, scary emotions that we try to control them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And if he's doing she or he is doing a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. how can we explain the child that he's doing this and it is the wrong way and uh, not using punishment or yelling or something like this so the reason why a young child is acting out is because they don't know how to act right because their brain is not developed they don't have emotional regulation they don't have planning They don't have thoughtfulness yet. Number two, they haven't lived long enough to have practice yet. And number three, they are just nervous and anxious around big, scary things. So in the moment, if you the parent can remember that, then they can stay calm. And then when the child does bad things, we can give them choices. Okay, you can't hit your sister, but here, you can go hit your pillow. Or I understand you're upset, Let's go outside and talk about it. Or, you know, you can make 
play. You can play with them or have humor. There's so many choices before anger. Anger is the choice we use because our parents use anger with us. Our parents did fight, flight or freeze. They either fought with us, they ran away or they froze. And that's what comes up in us as well. And I talk about different yeah. styles in the book as well. Uh, because we get so nervous when our children do wrong things because we think about the future. Oh, my child is going to be a loser. Or we think about, oh my God, I'm such a bad parent. Or we think, how dare my child defy me and make it personal. Yeah, plus the parents have a sense of emergency. Like if they see like the wrong behavior, they feel the urge to fix it right yes. away. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that this thing will not connect immediately with the child's identity. Like he's supposed or she's supposed to make mistakes. But this emergency feeling like I have to correct and to fix, to save my kid is probably given by this consumer society, by our expectations to, uh, I don't know, get the results right in time. And I notice in my practice as a school teacher that most parents, that they find the better understanding among them and their children if they give them rewards, if they promise uh, them things. So, because it's so easy now to promise something, an object, an important thing to your kid and make him or yes, her I'll feel buy calm. A toy. I'll buy a toy, I'll give you the iPad, we'll go to this trip, or if you go to your grandparents, I'll give you the iPad and so on. How do I take the, as a teacher, right, as a school's principal, how do I take the parents out of this, you know, crazy system to promise their kids all kind of re kinds of rewards for good behavior? Well, some children who have a lot of attention problems mm -hmm. do need a lot of feedback, like mm -hmm. a job or now we can go on a break or now we can go have an ice cream. Mm -hmm. They need like a reward system for because they don't have the capacity to remember what they're supposed to do. So they need feedback. Mm -hmm. But I think it's okay to give praise and prizes. But that cannot be the reason why your children listen. Your children need to have a connection with you where the relationship makes them come along with you. The relationship makes them want to do good. So that's what we're trying to do in this book and through our work is how do you build a relationship where they are open to your influence and they are coming toward you because they they're not being controlled by you, they're not scared of you, but they are your friend in a way. They're not your friend, but in a way, the friend, they're, they're your partner and they feel like you're their partner and together you all are working to a goal. That's what we want the parent to create in the child, not just promises of, you know, iPhones and movies and ice cream. It's the relationship that should be rewarding also. But how can we handle this comparison? Oh, the other kids, the other kids have tab, uh, tablet, f iPhones. Uh, I don't know a lot of toys, and I don't have. I have your trust, you know, <laughs> mom. Yeah, it's with with screens. It's a whole other topic because now all these children want the screens younger and younger, mm -hmm. and I think parents need to be very strong and realize that that the screens are not healthy. They are not effective they are actually harmful and you should say no to your children for screens if they're under 13 you should limit it and your friends your children's friends parents you should show them this video mm -hmm, and tell course. them yeah. not not to bring this into the playing you know children should go back to playing outside and not be playing video games and parents need to cooperate together because it's very hard when you're the only parent and every other parent is not doing it. So educate the other parents, show them this video and together make a decision that is actually for the best interest of your child. It's to the best interest of your child that they are not on screens, that they are playing together, that they're talking. Now, after 15 or 16, you may not be able to control it. That's OK. But at least when the children are having a childhood till 13, you should try to limit the screens. You posted the other day uh, on your Instagram um, a reel and uh, it seemed to me very interesting about uh, this obsession of people for more 
to have more, to do more. And I think uh, it's also um, um, like uh, also for parents because we want more for our children, like more piano lessons, more ballet, more tennis, more swimming, more foreign languages, a lot of foreign languages. And it's like a competition. They don't have time for play outside, as you say. Yes, and that is a big, big, big problem. Everywhere. Because we think that, you know, we're raising future, you know, scientists and future presidents and CEOs. No, childhood is a very separate phase of life, even though it's the most important. It needs to be treated like childhood, not like adulthood. Mm -hmm. Childhood means lots of time, downtime, lots of imagination, lots of creativity, lots of boredom and lots of play. But we think that childhood is the foundation of adulthood only in the way that we're creating an adult. No, we, it, when we don't give childhood its due respect, adulthood gets messed up. So if, if in childhood you're putting so much pressure on the child to grow up, you're, you're actually messing up the rest of your adulthood. Childhood is its own phase and children need to be treated like children, not like adults. They are children. They have different needs. You're not training an adult. You're raising a child. And I think parents don't realize children's brains work differently. Their language is different. Their emotions are different. And if those needs are not met in childhood, all of life will be a problem for them in at least relationships. What kind of an adult can this child become? Well, you know, it's not, it, it depends on the, the resiliency and the temperament of the child. Some children grow up to be a, still amazing adults. It's not like one is to one, mm -hmm. but that child will have issues in relationships with intimacy, with uh, emotions, with vulnerability. That child will not feel safe because they have been objectified, right? They've been told that they are perfect and they have to be perfect and they're objectified. So when they grow up, they objectify themselves and other people. So if they're not looking amazing, acting amazing, or other people are not looking amazing and acting amazing, they cannot tolerate it. They want amazing all the time because they were told in childhood that amazing is the way to get love. If you're not amazing, you don't get love. Răspunde tensiunilor cu calm în 5 minute. Extravalerianii cardio controlează atacurile de panică și emoțiile puternice. Se spune că nu există părinte care să nu fie stresat sau să simtă stări de anxietate cauzate de emoții puternice sau chiar atacuri de panică. Din momentul în care s-a născut copilul, mereu îți faci griji pentru el și poate că cei mai dificili sunt primii ani atunci când și somnul e deficitar. Din experiența mea vă spun că cel mai greu mi-a fost să fiu privată de somn. Să știți că există totuși soluții. Nimeni nu-și dorește o viață plină de stres sau anxietate. Pe lângă somn, sport sau alimentație sănătoasă mai există și suplimente pe bază de plante care ajută mult. Un astfel de exemplu este extravaleriani cu un anxiolitic pe bază de plante care se administrează ușor ușor, sublingual, așa că în doar 5 minute deja vă simțiți mai bine. Vă redobândiți echilibrul interior, vă simțiți din nou stăpân pe situație și, foarte important, nu are reacții adverse. Zunivers Podcasts I loved in your book uh, the chapter about kids' essences and about the fact that parents have their own essences they have forgot. Uh, like the way they played in childhood, the way they ran, the way they laughed. Most of us forgot who we were during childhood. And recovering this inner self and then embracing these two selves with the third one that is very understanding for who we were, how we got here, a bit of screwed up, yes, with our ego. I love that process about finding the third ego or the third, I don't know, dimension of yourself that embraces all these mistakes, all of who you've been, all you, ha you have become. I think this is the essence, the point where you actually start seeing your kid for who it is. Can you explain yeah. to our listeners or viewers what this third self is that embraces everything else from your past? <laughs> yeah, so that third self is the adult self 
that is compassionate, empathic, understanding, non-judgmental, loving, kind. And but that self is loving, kind, and compassionate to the self of the parent first. Mm -hmm. The parent has to develop that self. When the parent develops that sense of self, then they can see other people with that same compassion and forgiveness and non-judgment and empathy. But when the parent doesn't have it for themselves, it's very hard for them to give it to others. And uh, that's what I teach in this book: how parents can learn. to give themselves compassion and uh understanding and forgiveness you know so many of us live in so much torture inside us and because we don't like ourselves and we don't accept ourselves obviously we want to accept our children because we are pushing ourselves to become better it's quite natural we're going to push them to become better but all of us just want to be accepted for where we are we don't want to become better we want to be accepted for where we are and i think parents think it's their job to make their children better and i always say you're going to make it worse because no one wants to be always told oh you can be better right imagine if i told you right now you know what you guys are not doing a great job let's do it again you can do it better you're going mm-hmm. to feel so um, embarrassed ashamed you're going to think i did it the best i could <laughs> and that's what we do with our children all the time you know what do it better do it better and we keep pushing them what that makes them feel is oh who i am right now is not good enough i have to be more for this person but i think it's a lot of pressure uh, also on moms because uh, nowadays uh, women have uh, a career they have a family they are uh, they are being mothers at home and how can we balance all these roles Yeah, it's very hard for the woman who wants to do everything and she cannot balance it. She's going to mess it up because you cannot do so much. You cannot you have to decide where to put your energy. How to put your energy in three children, a career, your body and your husband, you know, or partner, how and your friends and your self-care and your mother. How are you going to do it? It's impossible. and i think women are putting a lot of pressure to do it all yeah we can do it all but should we do it all at the same time and we can do it all but not at the same time so we have to just relax and stop feeling this pressure to do it all all at once where do i start from like if i feel this self negative talk about I'm not doing enough. I'm not good enough. I have to I'm not move good enough, my yes. kids faster to this route to success. How does a woman start talking in a different manner to herself if she's been hearing things all this life or her life? But you, you the, my book A Radical Awakening yeah. is very popular in Romania. Yeah, sure. yes, yes, it is. Yes. So they should be that book. <laughs> But um the reason why women push themselves so much is because they have agreed that they are not good enough until they look a certain way act a certain way or live a certain way and that's not true so when women begin to empower themselves that they are good enough right now as they are that's when they will be able to not listen to what culture is saying and internalize a way of being calm and present um and that's what we women need to give to ourselves so that we can give it to our children can we tell our children when we are wrong when we feel we get something wrong when we do something wrong with them it's it's good to say that you were wrong but that's not where it ends it's more important to go to a coach or a therapist to understand why you keep doing that and what is the reason so that you can begin to change the child doesn't want to see that you're they don't care they just want a different mom or a different dad who doesn't yell at them right they don't care that you're sorry about yelling they care that you're learning why you're yelling and that you do the work so that when you come back next time you don't yell right they don't need you to say sorry that's a good thing but often we say sorry to our children because we feel bad about ourselves and we want them to forgive us but it's not about really understanding what we are doing we have a huge problem in our um, 
educational system in Romania because it hasn't been like changed for years, for decades. And now teachers believe that kids are, I don't know, naughty. They're not well behaved. They don't have respect for teachers or parents. Is there such a thing as a disrespectful child? Well, a child can act in ways that appear disrespecting, but they're not meaning to disrespect you. They are showing that they're upset and they do it in ways that are not sophisticated. Even we adults do it in ways that are not sophisticated. But what are they trying to say is that they don't feel understood, they don't feel safe, they don't feel heard or validated. So if we just stay stuck at the behavior, then we're going to get stuck in a power struggle. When we go underneath and we say, well, what is the reason they're feeling bad about themselves or they're feeling like they need me to hear them and I'm not hearing them, then we can shift in our energy and attack the problem differently. Instead of coming with rage, we're coming with compassion. And we're trying to understand and we are trying to forgive the behavior and understand that there was something deeper inside the child that needed support. Mm -hmm. So there's no way we can hold a child responsible for his behavior until he's like what age? No, of course you can hold them responsible, but you don't shame them. Mm -hmm. So if they drop if they drop the paint, they should clean it up with you. Mm -hmm. But you don't tell them, oh, you're such a bad boy and you always do this and you're so stupid. We don't we don't tell them that in a way that makes them feel bad. We we help them to take accountability to clean it up, but we don't scream at them because they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And we don't enter in this fighting zone because parents mostly, when they want to correct the child, they just put on their like cape of a fighter, like, I'm, I'm going to make you do this. And the kid says, no, I'm not going to do this. Please and that's stop, it. Please stop uh, jumping on the sofa. I will jump on the sofa. I'm going to come and take you down. I will do it no, no matter what you say. How do you take a parent out of this fighting zone? How do you make him or her take a helicopter and look from above? I know it's so hard because yeah. in that moment, the parent is having a panic attack and the parent is acting like a child because mm -hmm. they are in high stress, flight or fight, and they are totally, lo they've lost it. And so with compassion, when they go for therapy or to a coach, only that way, they have to get help. Mm -hmm. They cannot do it on their own. So they have to go to a therapist like me and they get help. And I have compassion for them and I help them understand why they're doing it. They're doing it because of their childhood. And, and I teach them what to do in those moments and mm -hmm. to practice. It's not going to be easy, but they can practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. And what are boundaries? What Because many people misinterpret. I want to have strong boundaries with my child what is, what are these boundaries what how does a parent like set boundaries yeah boundaries are what you are going to do as a parent so if you don't mm -hmm. like your child eating cookies don't buy cookies mm -hmm. if you don't like a child leaving the light on all the time then take out the light bulb if you don't like a child not doing the washing don't do the washing mm -hmm. you understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is very hard because i like to do i like a clean house so now i what i don't do the washing so <laughs> you see it's very hard because boundaries are all about what i can do it's not about what the other person needs to do it's what i need to do so if i don't like you're yelling at me i'm going to leave the room or if they're very small then i'm just going to not answer back what can i do in my part to make this better So, right? That's what a boundary is. It's like, not about creating walls. Yeah. But many times people create a wall and they think that's a boundary. That's not a boundary. That is horrible when you create a wall between you and the other person and the other person feels so bad that they are they cannot reach you. You don't want to ever not be able to be reached by your children. But you can just choose to not participate. That's a boundary. You can choose to leave the room. That's a boundary. You can choose to not yell. That's a boundary. Mm -hmm. So boundaries are about what you can do, not about what the other person needs to do. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Shefali, there are a lot of parents, including me, who are afraid of uh, our teenager children. Of course, my children are still small. They are four and six, but I'm looking <laughs> forward <laughs> to this uh, time. Uh, can be easy, this relationship between a parent and the teenager? Because... 
it looks very difficult. Well, it's not never easy, but it can be less crazy and less insane. And it can be actually an amazing time during a very difficult time. Teenagers are going through a very difficult time. They're looking for their identity. Their brain is changing. Their hormones are changing. They don't know who they are. Uh, they don't like you as much because now they realize you're not so smart. So it's not an easy time for the teenager. And that makes it very hard for the parent to stay regulated. So it's not an easy time, but the more control we have or want, the less easy it's going to be. The more you trust your teenager, the more you can be casual and talk lovingly and openly without power tripping them. And the more you join them in play and connection, the more easy it can get. But it's never easy time. Nothing in childhood is easy. It goes from heart to heart to heart to heart. Yes, but we are afraid of, of afraid of these dangers nowadays, like drugs, uh, other substances. Yeah, you have to talk to your kid early on about drugs, like four four years old, five years old. Don't wait till they're twelve. Start talking about drugs at five and six. Like, oh, there's this thing called drugs, and people take it, and it's very harmful. And you know, when your when your friends come to you, you have to learn to say no, and your friend will say please, please, and you have to say no, and you can practice from age four and five. But the best way to not get your kids on drugs is try to see them. If you see them and honor them and accept them, then they don't have to hate themselves. When they hate themselves, they go to drugs. And if they don't hate themselves, it's quite hard for that kid to go on drugs. They could still go and it's not your fault, but it's never your fault. But try to work hard to help them to love themselves if they love themselves they won't go to drugs quite likely not go to drugs when they go through that stage when just they just close their uh, bedroom door and they don't let you in how often do i knock at their door how often do i want them you i want to check with them how often do i want them in my living room being the same nice yeah, you kids? don't yeah you don't knock on their door you make them want to knock on your door mm -hmm. meaning you become interesting and cooking and happy and put the music on and you are dancing, you're having fun, you're playing games outside with your partner and they should come out going, oh, what's going on mm -hmm. here? Let me join you. Mm -hmm. You see, you have to become an attractor. You have to become a magnet, not a beggar. You know, how do you become a magnet, not a beggar? Well, having your own life and feeling fulfilled yeah. with your own life. Yeah. And you're so fun that they want to be with you, mm -hmm. you know? And that is the key where you are going, oh, really, I don't want to be with you. Why do you want to be with me? Like, that's the that's the place you want to arrive where your kid wants to be with you. Do kids need to be like understanding with their parents? Do they have empathy for their parents? I mean, you you want to hope that they do. But they but, don't. Uh, <laughs> but it's not because they're mean to you. It's because they're very uh, in, absorbed in their own life. They're full of their own issues. But sensitive children are very empathic. You know, I don't have a very highly sensitive daughter, uh, but she has other good qualities. Uh, but she's not like super taking care of me. And that makes me have to take care of myself. Um, so it depends on the temperament of the child. But it's not the child's job to be empathic to the parent. They should be. They should be nice enough. We would want that, but they don't have to take care of us. Sure. What are the main triggers for parents in the relationship to their children? There's so many triggers, you know. Most um, common, yeah. I think when our children feel big feelings of pain, that's very hard for us mm. because we want to protect them. We want to defend them. We want to make them happy because that makes us feel like we are succeeding, like we're getting an A grade. And so big emotions are very hard for us. I think that's the number one thing that's very hard. And the other thing is when our children develop their own mind and they want to follow their own way and they don't listen to us, that makes us feel like we're stupid, like we're not good enough. Again, everything comes back to, do I feel good enough? 
and our children who are not listening to us make us feel very insecure. Yeah. And how should we uh, react when uh, our teenager child uh, tells us, you know nothing, uh, you're not so uh, good date, enough. Yeah. Yes, uh, you you're not the person I thought you were when I was a little one. Should we be angry or should we stay no. calm? Calm. That is the most, <laughs> yeah, that's the most important thing they can say is, wow, you're not on the pedestal anymore. Now you're a regular human and you're like, yes, I'm a regular human being. Welcome to my world, right? But we don't like that. We want them to think of us as God. And so when they bring us down, which is going to happen, we don't like it and we feel devastated and we call it disrespect. No, they finally became smart to realize, oh, my parent is a human and not so smart and not so amazing human. But we don't like that because we loved it when our children looked up to us, you see? Yeah. But for most anxious mothers who listen to us, is there a, like a line I should always skip to in order to keep him in check? Is there I think the best the best line that I use is it's not personal. It's not personal. It's not personal. <laughs> uh, they don't mean it, right? It's not personal. Have compassion. They don't mean it. They they are going through their own struggle. And the other line is, my child is in pain. My child is in pain. My child is in pain. You know, my child is not giving me a problem. They're having a problem. Um, these things just help you to stay regulated and calm and loving in a loving place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Shefali. Um, and um, we're hoping one day you will uh, come. Uh, uh, yes, I want to come. I want to come. Thank you. Maybe, you. maybe I will arrange that because yes. I have so many people waiting for you. I yes, really let's do it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. We will write I, to you. Yeah. You're very yes. loved here, you know. <laughs> yes. I love it. Thank you so Thank much you for so having much. Thank, Thank you, Romania. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, Dr. Shefali. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, da, a fost uh, one of the leaders pe care uh, și eu așteptam și tu așteptai de foarte multă vreme cărțile lui Dr. Șefali da. sunt de adevăr inspiraționale pentru părinți din toată lumea și Da, a venit că... așa ca un șoc în, în exact. cultura de parenting. Acum au mai apărut oameni care sau femei care folosesc, să zicem, mesajul ei. Mm -hmm. Dar ce ne propune ea și de ce a venit ca un șoc și de ce Oprah a recomandat-o și... și o prefață scrisă da. de Dalai Lama? Da, pentru că ea tăia toate iluziile astea că putem da părinților un, o listă cu ce trebuie să facă pentru a repara copilul sau pentru a repara comportamentul și uh, a fost prima care a dat acest mesaj că tu trebuie să te uiți în tine să vezi ce se întâmplă cu tine ce trigăre ai, de ce te necășește copilul ăsta, de ce intri în luptă cu el de ce ți-e foarte milă de el de ce încerci să îl faci să pară ca fiind extraordinar în ochii lumii de ce îl copleșești cu atâta, te iubesc, te iubesc deci toate tiparele astea parentale în care într-o formă sau alta toți cădem le-a le dezgolit așa uh -huh. foarte, uh, și foarte clar foarte comic, concis, clar, clar da, dar da, foarte da. Uh -huh. uh, și n-a fost ușor eu am urmărit și acum 12 ani întâlniri în săli cu părinți foarte mulți care aproape o atacau cu întrebări, chiar așa chiar e totul despre mine, trebuie să simt vinovăție și pe urmă a nuanțat, nu simțim vinovăție dar uitându-ne în noi foarte bine ne uităm ce anume, ce emoții trăim noi atunci când copilul ratează ia o notă mică, sare prea mult pe canapea e respins la școală uh, de câte ori se întâmplă copilului ceva și bine și rău, noi trăim o emoție foarte puternică. Stăm foarte puțin cu emoția aceea, fiindcă nu sunt obișnuit să stăm pe banca asta, în banca asta inconfortabilă, aici să zicem emoția neputințe. Eu ca părinte mă simt neputincios, uh -huh. nu știu ce să mai fac cu copilul ăsta, m-a scos din minți, i-am explicat de nu știu câte ori, i-am spus frumos și el tot nu m-a spus. e despre mine, da. nu despre... Și eu nu știu să stau în starea asta de uh -huh. frustrare, și poate și teamă că nu sunt un părinte bun. Vreau să mă mut repede de pe banca asta și să fac ceva cu copilul. Sigur că trebuie să fac și ceva cu el, dar invitația ei, a filozofiei ei, este de a sta eu întâi în banca asta insuportabilă, care mă face să mă simt incapabilă în relație cu, părinte, cu copilul, neputincioasă, furioasă, temătoare că sunt un părinte rău și să văd cum trece starea asta prin mine. Când starea asta trece prin mine și realizez că întâi am eu o emoție prea puternică, 
ca să mai pot să-mi iau și autoritatea de a repara acest copil, se întâmplă ceva minunat, devii prezent, devii conștient. Uite, am așa o fantezie că al meu copil trebuie să mă asculte în orice moment, altfel înseamnă că mă... Nu știu că e opoziționist, ca apropo, acum. Opoziționismul a devenit așa etichetat ca fiind o, o trăsătură înăscută a copilului. Domnule, el e de vină, e opoziționist. Da? În cartea ei demonstrează că, de fapt, opoziționismul, reflexul copilului de a spune nu și de a se certa cu tine, este, de fapt, educat, fără să vrei, de tine, atunci când ai natural dorința de a pleca de pe banca asta în comodă și de a te certa în continuare cu copilul, de a găsi tot felul de argumente să-l faci să spună sau să ce, ce acționeze. Tu, de fapt. Da, da. Da. Oricum, și e uh, foarte greu de acceptat uh, asta. Să știi că uh, am citit zilele acesta uh, cartea, ultima carte a lui uh, Dr. Șefali și uh, m-a făcut de multe ori să iau o pauză de la citit și să mă gândesc la mine mică. Da, asta și am și retrăit mie. niște amintiri pe care le credeam de multuitate uh-huh, uh-huh. Pentru că m-a făcut să înțeleg de ce sunt într-un fel cu copiii mei. Da, Mi-am da. identificat și pattern-ul de da. părinte. În cartea e nemai pomenită că la un dat se ocupă, două capitole se ocupă doar de tine, abia da. a treia parte da. se ocupă de exact. copil. Și în, într-unul din ele te invită să vezi ce copil erai tu, uh-huh. de care uh-huh. copil, ce tip aveai. Erai genul agitat, erai genul interiorizat, erai genul, genul aventurier, erai genul supărăcios. Ce s-a întâmplat cu copilul ăla? Și cred că mai dureros e capitolul în care îți identifică ție modelul de părinte care ești. Da. Și având acolo scris cu cauză efect, da. e foarte dureros. Da. da, e dureros și în același timp un puternicitor, că îți dai seama că Revelator, sunt niște mecanisme da. psihologice simple de apărare. Eu, copilul aventuros, care mă răneam des urcându-mă pe gardul bunicii, uh, pentru că n-am primit, de exemplu, suficientă blândețe sau grijă în momentul ăla că eram singură, nu? Poate că acum cu copilul meu sunt atât de anxios că nu lasă să se urce pe niciun gard. Dau un exemplu uh-huh. foarte banal și când vezi care a fost spiritul tău, care e tiparul tău de acum încercând să repar ceva ce n-ai înțeles în copilărie, n-ai primit sau din potrivă pentru care ai fost certat, Uh, îți dai seama imediat că poate, nu știu, 80% din comportamentul tău nu este despre ce face copilul, ci despre ce trăire ai tu în moment, ce n-ai reparat din trecut, despre cum te judeci că nu ești suficient de bun. Și mai spunea că modul în care ne vorbim no. noi înșine, mm-hmm. însene, și că modul în care le vorbim acum va deveni și modul în, ca, în care își vorbi ei când vor fi mari. Dacă de fapt e un lanț pe e care îl lanț. Și de asta spune trezește-te, awakening da. sau... Și fii tu primul care rupe din lanțul, lanțul, da. da. Și cartea uh, scoasă la Bookzone, <coughs> unde am scris și o, un, o, prefață, o prefață, da. te invită așa, pas cu pas, să treci printr-o procedură internă, nu medicală, nici mare psihologică, simplă, cu multe exemple, de la momentul ăsta adormit în care doar reacționez la ce face copilul meu, la descoperirea a ceea ce sunt eu, a ceea ce eram, a, a măștilor pe care le port acum ca, să, ca să-mi fie bine, să mă mișc de la o zi la alta a săptămânii, să mă turăsc uneori și la ultima, să zicem, identitatea noastră, aceea care le îmbrățișează pe toate, aceea care începe să-și vorbească să ieși mama, da? să ieși cu îngăduință, cu încredere, cu răbdare, aceea care nu se mai teme că se strică copilul dacă nu repar acum și se strică pe veci. Și ce este absolut prețios în carte pe lângă metoda asta e că uh, oferă exemple concrete de copii care se poartă sau pățesc ceva da, anume. Da, din terapia da, pe care a făcut-o ea cu clienții ei. Și ce da. anume să-i spui, uh-huh. chiar așa ca o piesă de teatru uh-huh. uneori, ca un scenariu despre cum procedezi și ce faci, uh-huh. pentru că totuși părinții așteaptă uh, Corect, soluții. List. Da, soluții. Da. Soluții da. simple. Uh, Oana, a fost o întâlnire uh, foarte inspirațională și pentru noi și sper că și pentru părinții care ne ascultă și uh, ne vedem săptămâna viitoare la Părinți cu Minți într-un episod în care o să fim noi doi și o să putem să le uh, răspundem părinților pentru că ne scriu o mulțime de întrebări. Da, am foarte multe și întrebări, le primim, în le primim și o să încercăm să le onorăm în următoarele episoade. Mulțumim, ne vedem săptămâna viitoare la Părinți cu Minți. Thank mm-hmm. you.